Workplace Health Insights Live, our very, very first session on dental. And uh, hopefully you're going to feel the passion coming, uh, coming through your screen today as we uh, talk about this subject that we are really, really passionate about at Bupa. So for those joining us for the first time, we've created this series to discuss the healthcare challenges faced by UK business. Uh, this is part of our commitment to keep you informed on the latest trends we're seeing within Bupa and across the wider healthcare market. And as I say, today we're showcasing on dental. So our role is to help you and your clients navigate the health and wellbeing landscape. So you always feel one step ahead when it comes to healthcare challenges of your workforce. So today we'll be looking at the disruption the dental industry has faced over the past year. We'll discuss how the pandemic has shaped the dental market today and what we expect to see in the future as digital dentistry continues to accelerate. We know that people across the UK are facing delays for NHS treatment, which could have a significant impact on the nation's oral health. Our priority at Bupa is to support our customers to help them find support when they need it, whether it's remotely or within a Bupa dental practice. We also believe that digital has an important role to play as we look beyond disruption. So today we'll hear how clinical and tech innovations have the potential to redefine the customer experience, what this means for the dental practice of the future. Now for us at Bupa, um, growth in the dental insurance and provision markets remains a core strategy, both in the UK and globally, um, something we're really passionate about. And we're really passionate about um, people's oral health care. Um, it's not about selling more insurance or, um, you know, footfall. It's really, you know, starting with oral health care and what that means to somebody and their overall health uh, and well-being. Um, dental insurance is a proactive product that's designed for customers to use and engage with regularly, uh, which is quite different to other insurance policies. It gives us the opportunity to talk to our customers throughout the year. Uh, this dynamic plus our ability to offer fantastic in-clinic experiences place us in the perfect position to deliver a best-in-class, smooth and engaging service to our customers, focused on supporting them with their oral hygiene. So to today's agenda, um, we have Dr. Neil Sicker, our Chief Dental Officer for UK Insurance, and he's going to spend five minutes summarising the impact of the pandemic on the dental industry. Uh, Neil will then be joined by colleagues from Bupa Dental Care, so Susie Lloyd, our Head of Clinical Policy, and Fazan Zahir, our clinical director North. We'll hear about what it was like on the front line over the past year and predictions about how patients and the workforce will be impacted beyond the pandemic. After that, we'll jump into the future of dentistry section, where we'll hear from Susie on the clinical innovations happening in the clinic. And we're then moving to Alistair Adams, uh, Bupa's global dental strategy manager, who will update on the practice of the future. Um, Neil and I will wrap up with a quick chat about the innovation we're seeing that may shape insurance products in the future. And finally, we'll take your questions in a Q&A. So we've got loads to get through. Um, we've got lots of experts gathered here today, much more expert than me in the subject. So I think we'll get started. Um, I'm now going to introduce you to Neil, um, our Chief Dental Officer and Practicing Dentist. Neil has over 30 years of experience in providing dental care to companies and employees. And we work closely with Neil to develop our products and services. So over to you, Neil. Thanks very much, Richard. It's great to be with you all today. And thank you for taking the time to join us. Also a big welcome to Susie and Fazan. Um, I'm gonna spend just a few minutes now to just briefly update you on the landscape of dentistry across the UK and how our patients have been affected by COVID-19. I'm then gonna ask Susie and Fazan for their thoughts and predictions about the future. So COVID-19 actually exacerbated existing issues within the dental industry. Our practices were closed for three months last year where we couldn't provide any face-to-face -face treatment for our patients. And that's actually created a twin crisis within the industry, both in terms of accessibility and also affordability. The British Dental Association has estimated that 30 million fewer NHS appointments were delivered in the year from March 2020. And actually, we're hearing reports in the press as well of NHS waiting times for checkups of up to three years. And within our own practices, we've had to change our own operating procedures considerably. So this relates to PPE requirements, infection control procedures, social distancing within our reception areas, 
but also something called fallow periods, where we actually have to leave the surgery empty between patients to allow the aerosol to settle when we provide certain treatments. So this has all led to less availability for patients. And patients not being able to see their dentist doesn't allow us to necessarily detect poor oral health early. And this has had wider ramifications. So there's been a huge reduction in oral cancer referrals, which actually is really worrying because mouth cancer cases have increased by over a third in the past 20 years. As dentists, we actually perform an oral cancer screen as a standard on all our patients as part of a general checkup. And that lack of access to appointments has actually led to a 65% reduction in onward referrals. So in addition, the lack of NHS access is leading to greater demand for private treatment. And we're also seeing that within, within our own business in the insurance industry in terms of increased inquiries from um, employers looking to support their employees. But these additional pressures have actually had quite a strain on the dental profession itself. We've seen dentists and nurses leaving the profession, and that's actually had a really detrimental impact on employee health. And this is really concerning. I know that I've actually seen with certain um, colleagues of my own, clinicians who have found it really difficult to treat patients with additional levels of PPE, and they've decided not to continue. And the BDA, the British Dental Association, has actually undertook a survey that predicts that 47% of dentists are likely to change career or seek early retirement. And this is really concerning because oral health is really important. There are now really established links between oral health and general health. Gum disease has been linked to heart disease, strokes, and even Alzheimer's. And we know that people with underlying health issues are more susceptible to viruses like COVID. So it's now really important more than ever to educate people on the links between oral and general health and the power of prevention. So I encourage everyone always to book in for their regular checkups if they haven't done so already. So that's enough from me. Let's now hear from Susie and Fazan, who've also experienced firsthand the disruption to dental practices and their own patients over the past year. So firstly, welcome to Susie, who is a general practice dentist and also heads up clinical policy for Bupa Dental Care. Susie was actually responsible for coordinating and planning and the execution of Bupa Dental Care's return to work after the initial practice closures. Welcome, Susie. Thanks so much, Neil. Oh, no, great to join you today. Well, it's great to have you on, on, on with us today. So, Susie, can you explain your experience over the past 12 months from a Bupa Dental Care perspective? Sure, thanks, Neil. Um, yeah, I certainly would reiterate um, a lot of the comments that you just made. I mean, we're now seeing both a huge demand for NHS treatment and private treatment, um, but that's certainly accelerating that demand for private treatment uh, due to the level of the, of the backlog that is remaining in a lot of NHS practices. So uh, as part of the Bupa UK clinical team, a, a real priority has been working to transition our, our 490 practices back to, to some kind of business as usual, whilst also negotiating new regulations and, and that really pent up demand. Predicting quite how long this will last is, is very, very difficult. But what we do know is that um, there was a huge demand for NHS uh, dental services even before the pandemic and events of the last 12 to 18 months have really just exacerbated that demand. NHS waiting lists for referrals to secondary care are unprecedented at the moment. Uh, personally, I, I've even struggled to get children that are in pain in for urgent extractions that were not possible to, um, to, to be completed in general practice without having to, to apply quite significant pressure. Also, NHS orthodontists in many areas are quoting at least two years for an assessment appointment and then perhaps the same again for treatment to start. So hence the upturn in demand for, for private treatment. And here you've really got a perfect storm. You've also got your, um, your really well-managed patients that have missed the service that they valued and invested in over uh, the recent years. And they're very keen to then resume normal services. Um, and many patients just can't cope with, with the NHS waiting list time. So they're obviously opting to go, um, to go privately. The other trend that I'm sure a lot of our strategic partners on the call um, have also noted um, during COVID-19 
is that it's really focused people's attention on where they spend their money. And preventative healthcare is now seen as a very sensible place to spend. So our challenge is to try and accommodate as many existing and new patients as possible across all of our brands. Uh, and all of our uh, BIPA dental care practices have been open since last June. Uh, we're encouraging all our members to see their dentists for their regular checkups uh, wherever that's possible. Thank Thanks you. very much, Susie. Um, I suspect the last 18 months have been not, like nothing you have ever experienced before. But you must be, I, I got to say, you must be really proud of your role in getting practices up and running so quickly. And I personally want to say thank you as a dentist in one of the practices. So now let's hear from Fazan, who is one of our Bupa Dental Care Clinical Directors. He's also a specialist in periodontology, which is gum treatment, and dental research. So welcome, um, Fazan. So from thank your you so experience much. in the field, how has the patient experience been impacted by the pandemic? Yeah, I think what both of what you and Susie have uh, said has very much summarized the crux of the problems that we've all um, experienced. And what this has led to is a very real impact on patients' lives. And just to kind of talk through some of the stuff that we hear reports of. So we've um, firstly, going back to the whole issue about access, it's resulted in patients having to wait for a considerable period of time for routine appointments. And in some cases, they've just had to be brought in for a quick patch up treatment and then left um, to be going back onto the waiting list till there's a spot opened up to provide more definitive treatment. So that's led to a lot of patients who may have um, benefited with definitive treatment at the outset now being patched up and over a period of time their uh, needs, the need for dental treatment is getting bigger and bigger and the type of treatments they need are likely to become more and more complex. So it's obviously resulting in the patient's being unhappy and dissatisfied and it's also making the job of the dental workforce a bit harder as well because we are having to treat more complex cases than what we would have had to do uh, compared to the past and overall it's resulting in the experience of patients um, uh, being uh, perceived as being quite negative towards the, the dental services because of all these factors that are going on. So their interaction with the dental services becomes so much harder and it's having an impact and obviously makes it harder than for us and our teams to deal with because everybody is overworked and we're struggling for capacity and resources. So, you know, our frontline teams like reception staff and so on are working as hard as they possibly can to continue to provide access while also keeping patients satisfied and happy and so on. The other big one, which, you know, understandably impacts a lot of people is the increased cost of uh, PPE. That's something, I mean, it's gone up by over tenfold um, since before um, COVID. And it's just a cost, which is something it's upsets everybody. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's something that we're trying our best to manage, but again, it's an ongoing thing and we're waiting and we're hoping that as time goes on, uh, these costs become a little bit more under control. Um, I guess um, the other point you guys have very much kind of covered as well is um, the, the, the whole issue around the private sector and how the NHS sector and private sector are interacting. Because of the um, excessive waiting list in the NHS sector, a lot of people are moving towards the private sector and it's slowly starting to change the landscape of um, how dental services were provided with a slight increase in the private sector compared to before. So there are just some of the a summary of some of the ways that people are becoming impacted by um, the COVID related issues. Thanks very much, Fazan. I know that, um, you know, during that period, the ability to give remote prescriptions, which we didn't necessarily have before, was actually a godsend for some of our patients who couldn't access treatment. Yeah. But as you rightly point out, we were patching them up. Um, and, and what, and, but what a lot of our patients don't necessarily realize is that um, having the antibiotics is not necessarily a cure and we need to ensure that we get them in for treatment as soon as possible. And that is still a challenge in some cases. Yep. So question for Susie. Um, there's been a lot of change in the dental landscape. What do you think are the key issues that lie ahead? Thanks, Neil. Yeah, yeah, there has been a lot of change uh, and we're probably going to see a little bit more. And um, I'd probably tackle this question um, in sort of three points. I, I think those, those 
three key issues that, that I would predict um, at sort of lying ahead are um, accessibility, inclusion, and, uh, and sort of uh, changes in lifestyle decisions. So, so firstly, accessibility. Um, the current routine secondary care referrals are, are on average around 52 weeks um, in, in most areas, which is really challenging for our clinicians to manage. But it does present an opportunity for private referrals for those that can afford it, which in, in itself it is obviously not a, um, not, not a fair issue. Um, and we do know that, that when dental treatment fails, uh, delaying treatment rarely improves the situation. So for many patients who, uh, as Faisan has very eloquently said, have been stabilised, um, had very well managed periodontal conditions, having restricted access to those services that have, have maintained their health very well has been really detrimental. But in some cases that, that's likely to be, um, to be recoverable. Secondly, um, the, there's an issue of inclusion. So um, the, the events of the last 12 to 18 months have created a disparity amongst certain groups, which could lead on to people's sort of general health and well-being and having a real knock on to that. We also know that certain groups um, and social certain demographics uh, lack education around oral hygiene. So it's really important that organize, organizations and healthcare workers really work together closely to educate and promote the benefits of prevention. The best form of dentistry is no dentistry at all. So when we can prevent issues, we'd much rather do that. And with this problem becoming more apparent, there's a real opportunity here for, for the workplace to provide a benefit that employers would really value and where there is a real need. Um, and then finally, um, I'd sort of come back to lifestyle decisions. We, we know for, for many that we've changed the way that we, we live and work over the last year. Um, and in some cases, people's health has really benefited from their new routines. Um, but in some cases, um, COVID has really accelerated poor uh, oral hygiene and poor lifestyle decisions. And that can really impact and lead to longer term um, oral health and, and general health impacts. Um, so it's really highlighted, again, the power of good diet, good oral hygiene and good regular checkups. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, thanks very much, Susie. I think I think we're very fortunate actually within the business to have the expertise of like yourself and for Zan and over 2000 clinicians, which is great because it means that we can provide support for employees in the workplace, local to where they were using our expertise. So a question for you, Fazan. We know COVID-19 has impacted not only patients, but also the workforce. What steps have practices taken to combat these challenges? And will this impact the workforce of the future and or patients? Yeah, I think um, one of the biggest concerns, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, was safety. People were generally concerned for their own safeties coming to work at a dental practice, as well as the safety of patients. And that obviously led to a very strict protocols, very strict policies to be put in place so that we can make sure that the risk of infection transmission is limited as much as possible. So to give you an insight of what that looks like, so for example, if you attend a practice for a filling, a dentist and the dental assistant will be wearing an FFP mask, which is essentially a fairly heavy duty mask, which prevents um, aerosol and things from tra traversing the mask and protects the clinician. We will then have to have a visor on top of that to make sure that there isn't that two-way um, spread of uh, things from one person to the other. We will have a gown on top of your clinical attire and some gloves um, as well, and oftentimes even something to cover your, uh, your hair. So all of that is quite exhausting. If you're doing that for about eight, nine hours and even just taking it on and off in between patients, it all adds up. And we're in a position now where we do have a very uh, a workforce who are really feeling the effects of this because it's been going on now for over 12 months and um it's uh, it's we've we've got quite a few things within bupa that we're trying our best to help support our workforce uh, we've um provided them with um, access to additional resources such as a very very high quality communication skills course to help them have those difficult conversations with patients um susie has been quite instrumental in, in making that happen We've got um, uh, access to um, uh, healthy mind services within Bupa for all of our clinicians and the rest of our um, employed workforce as well. And again, just to focus on uh, maintaining resilience and preventing burnout and anxiety that a lot of people may be facing at this particular moment in time. And um, 
the one of the challenges that I guess we've had as an ongoing thing has been uh, recruiting the right level of workforce to support our clinical teams and delivering safe and effective care. Because we have to understand the actual workload has also gone up significantly uh, in the practices because of the additional processes that they have to take um, to keep people safe. And we have had a bit of an outflow of uh, dental nursing staff from the profession. So we've got a lot less nurses available to recruit from than we did in the mm -hmm. past, which is putting an additional strain on, on us. And at the same time, when COVID isolation was um, got ongoing, um, especially at its peak times, we would have all of a sudden unplanned absences where people would have to isolate or due to childcare issues, children have had to isolate and so on. So all that really had a huge, huge strain on the workforce. One good thing, however, I'll point out, working for a company like Bupa meant that you didn't need to worry about your um, safety and compliance with the policies because Bupa helped do that for you. So we have people like Susie, who's head of our policy, who's done very detailed work on translating what the government guidelines look like for dental practices to give our teams very clear, easy direction and support to uh, carry them out in practice. So yeah, that's a summary from me. Thanks very much, Fazan. So Susie, Fazan, thank you so much for sharing those really valuable insights. Richard, I'm now going to hand back to you for our next exciting section. Thanks, Neil. Uh, really insightful conversation. And uh, one of the benefits of having um, you know, 490 dental practices, we can really get into uh, what's changing out there, what's going on, and um, um, super interesting. So uh, thanks, guys. And we'll definitely shape um, the future of uh, what we offer to our customers. Um, now, um, firstly, before we move on, please keep your questions coming in. We've had a few already. And we will come to them later as many as we can. And anything we can't cover, I'm sure we'll find a way uh, of getting out to you in the future. So let's keep moving. We're now on to the future of, uh, of dentistry. So we're going to hear three five-minute presentations, firstly from Susie, um, who will share the latest clinical innovations. Then we'll hear from Alistair, who's going to explore the dental practice of the future and what that might look like. And finally, Neil and I will discuss what this means for dental insurance going forward. So without further ado, let's uh, let's keep moving. Um, and uh, over to you, Susie, to kick us off. Thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, I'll spend about the next five minutes um, just going through some of the major innovations that we're seeing um, in clinics at the moment. Um, we've sort of cherry picked what we think are, are probably the most impactful um, and sort of highlighted the top four. So, so first of all, let, let's start off in the, the sort of top left of the screen with intraoral scanners. I'll try and keep this as high level um, as possible uh, without a too much jargon for, for the, uh, the non-clinicians out there. So basically intraoral scanners are um, a wand-like structure um, that is now um, highly utilised in clinic to digitalise um, as much impression taking as possible. So a wand is placed uh, within the mouth and it basically um, gives you a 3D scan, almost like a, a sort of full motion video um, of um, both upper and lower arches and all of the, um, the structures in your mouth. And we're expecting that the, the kind of the global internal scanner um, penetrations and numbers um, within clinics are going to more than double um, by, by 2026. They're currently sitting at just over just over 20% and we're expecting them to get, get near to sort of about 44% um, by, by 2026. So why is this beneficial? There are so many advantages of intraoral scanning. First of all, and most importantly, it's better for the customer. It's more accurate, it gives fewer mistakes, um, and much better visibility for treatment outcomes through artificial intelligence, things like digital smart design and predictions. So you could go into the clinic, have a, a digital scan, and your clinician can literally side by side give you a view of the current state of your dentition and then a digital mock-up of, of what that could be. So it's highly visual. It's also better for the clinician. It's much easier to talk through procedures with dental laboratories that supply the prosthetics, the crowns, the bridges, veneers, etc. that you're going to fit. It's also much more efficient uh, and it saves a lot of time uh, within the clinic. It's also better for, for corporates like ourselves. There's no physical storage of loads of impressions that needs to be done. And there's a lot of added data for enterprise analysis, um, you know, interpretation. Uh, and also, uh, very importantly, it's just far more sustainable. There's a lot less waste. Um, we don't have to be posting um, as many things out to laboratories, um, etc. It's also, crucially, the backbone to digital dentistry. 
uh, it, in, it, in order to sort of get that scan, once you have that digital data, it enables you to, um, to do things like remote monitoring um, and also increases your ability to offer remote triage. So imagine the power of already having a scan, already knowing what your patient's dentition looks like, then being able to speak to them on the phone, realise that they've had a fracture, they've lost part of their brace, etc. And being able to get them to take a quick photograph and then be able to overlay that onto your, um, your intraoral scan and tell them even remotely, yes, that's changed. Certainly a real step forward when you're trying to solve problems over the phone remotely for patients and not just looking at a photograph of a, a, a sort of a, a deep dark hole. Uh, and it also enables uh, digital lab workflows, which um, are very, very powerful for things like orthodontics and implants. The prosthetics are designed and manufactured digitally, uh, which is extremely efficient and very accurate. Um, and there's no need for those, um, those sometimes quite difficult um, sort of mould impressions where you get all the gunk in your mouth. Um, and it means that we can give patients faster time to teeth and fewer in-clinic visits, uh, which is very powerful. So now um, sort of moving on to, to the next area, um, if we sort of move um, at top right, um, advances in, in manufacturing um, techniques, oh, sorry, bottom right, that would be advances, uh, advances in manufacturing techniques. Um, the main things that are happening here is that um, milling is getting a lot better. So how we produce our crowns um, and, uh, and restorations. Um, but also there's, there's a second type of technology that, um, that we uh, use to manufacture a lot of these restorations, um, which is 3D printing. Um, and through our analysis, we actually feel that um, Whilst there's advantages and advances in both of these technologies, that actually 3D printing technology is going to be the one um, that is potentially um, going to become more common um, and going to become um, more, more interesting. And it's certainly a lot easier to do at scale. So that would sort of be our, our, our top tip for, for what to watch in the future. Um, going back up to, um, to to top right now. Sorry to sorry to dance around a bit. Keep you on your toes there. Um, but next, uh, I talk about advantages in uh, material science. We're seeing a lot of, um, of of movement in this space. It has um, accelerated um, and is really helped by um, by the movement in the digital space as well. But things like um, direct bonding, just the um, the strengths that we can get through um, through uh, the direct application of um, resins and materials that we can place chair side is, is a lot better and a lot stronger. Um, adhesive and minimal um, invasive dentistry is also um, becoming a lot more widespread. So what I mean by that is um, taking a much more conservative approach to dentistry. So rather than drilling and filling, um, we're now a lot clearer because we have um, a lot better quality of material. We now know that actually certain things can be left um, and we can, we can take a view on removing less tissue structure, um, which would um, mean that the patient has a better outcome and is left with a lot more of their um, original dentition. Um, and also that we have um, much more um, aesthetic restorations with better um, properties um, than traditional restorations, which gives the patient a better looking result, but also a stronger and more functional result. And then um, I move on to the last area. So um, artificial intelligence for, um, for x-ray um, analysis is, is a really important area. So this comes obviously within digital dentistry and digital lab flows. There's a lot of nascent um, artificial intelligence technology that can now analyze x-rays, support clinicians in diagnostics, um, which is really, really helpful and time saving. Um, but it's also very, very useful for a patient um, because you can show a patient an annotated image of their teeth, which shows up any more um, any pathology so it's a much more transparent way to communicate with your patients. It really helps to build trust in the dentist. It's, it's got sort of less of a dark art and you're sort of pointing out, can you see that highly pixelated grey area? Oh, this means that. And it's quite a good way of, of helping to, to communicate any problems. It also gives dental practices new data, um, which is really useful for us as a corporate body to assure quality, um, identify any missed opportunities. So people may be um, missing, uh, missing 
and treatments. Um, and also this is being highly utilised um, in the United States at the moment. There's aspects of, um, of claims fraud automation. So you can actually work out if people are claiming things that they shouldn't be. Not that that is a massive problem for us and I hope it would never be, be but, uh, but it is an interesting area. So lots of digitalization, lots of technological advancements, both with materials, equipment, um, and that digital workflow. Um, but finally, I just also pick up in a real shift in the softer side of dentistry. Um, I th really think the focus um, amongst a lot of our clinicians in particular is really shifting to work on their communication skills and work on um, really delivering empathetic treatment and um, really getting the patient to be involved in that patient journey and really taking responsibility for their own treatment. So it's something, a, a journey that we all go on together rather than dentistry being something that is done to a patient. Thanks, Richard. Great. Thanks, Susie. That was uh, absolutely fascinating. I'm loving the, uh, you know, the focus on using um, technology to, to make things more convenient, personalised for patients and so on. I think it's a real, real step forward and probably accelerated by the COVID landscape that we, uh, we start with. Now, um, we're actually going to put a poll live um, to ask you, the audience, um, a question. So the question is, um, do you think digital innovation will take over when it comes to oral health care and maintenance outside of treatment? Um, now, I'm going to tell you the results later, but you'll see it come up on your screen. Please uh, let us know what you think. Uh, it would be uh, uh, really great, and uh, we'll bring that into the conversation later on. Now, let's keep moving. Um, let's now hear from Alistair, uh, who joined Booper in 2020 and manages the Global Dental Working Group, which is a team that supports collaboration between Booper's global dental businesses uh, with a combined thousand clinics and uh, they're you know all over the world from uh, obviously the UK but also Poland, Chile, um, Spain and Australia and New Zealand. So um, Alistair over to you. Thanks Richard. Uh, it's great to be here today and I'll spend the next five minutes talking about the dental practice of the future. Looking ahead it's a very exciting time for dental. Customer needs and expectations have dramatically changed over the past decade as a result of digitalization. The pandemic has accelerated the role digital plays in healthcare, with digital dentistry becoming a reality in the past year. Outside of the clinic, customers are starting to be able to interact with their dentists digitally. This includes the ability to manage appointments via patient portals. You know, we're starting to see patients being able to, uh, you know, access features such as online, such as online booking to, uh, to book and manage appointments, fill out their medical forms electronically so you don't have to do it in a rush when you get to the clinic. Customers can access portals to review and choose their funding options. This can be for preventative care or for specialised complex treatments. Maybe they can access information about the clinic such as your clinician's credentials and experience. And finally, um, customers can log in to review treatment plans and see expected outcomes, and again, review what kind of funding can help support them through their treatment. As well as patient portals, either on a website or an application, um, we're seeing some more new and exciting digital channels. This includes AI chatbots to support customers with dental care and information, and digital screens in clinic. This can be iPads, which you give to the customer for them to access their information when they're when they're waiting for an appointment, um, or maybe kiosks for people to check in and see any kind of information about the clinic. But with digital, dental care won't just be every six months in the clinic. Increasingly, customers will be able to access aspects of remote care. Customers can access dental information that's personalised to them based on their medical records and what their dentist has recommended. Customers can access consumable sales. You know, I can buy exactly the, the, the right TP brushes or the toothpaste that my dentist thinks that I need for my oral health. Maybe we can access your medical history. You can view, view your images. Um, you know, uh, if you're considering a treatment, uh, you know, show, show those images to your family. Um, and what's very exciting is the possibility for remote appointments. Now, a remote appointment could be clinical, and for the time being, you can't be a face-to-face -face appointment. You know, the dentist being able to see you in person with a lot of uh, imaging technology in clinic. But we are seeing some exciting new artificial intelligence technology that supports some of these use cases. We see this today, for instance, for treatment plan review. If you have orthodontics, 
Uh, you don't need to go to the dentist every, every two months for them to check up. A lot of that can be done remotely with AI technology. But there are exciting use cases for remote appointments which are non-clinical. So this is helping to bring customers closer to their dental provider. And this can be discussions with your dentist or treatment coordinator to review your treatment plans and review your funding in a way that's more convenient for the patient. But what is really important to enable all of this? And behind the scenes, it's centralized operations. This is very new in dentistry, but having one centralized practice management system and single patient record across the estate. This means that customers can now access dentistry anywhere there is a clinic and dental service organizations like Bupa can use new data from this enabled by advances in AI to really personalize the customer experience you know, by channel tailored to them um, and, and with really personalized and targeted communications. But this also means that dental service organizations can refine their operations like never before. And this, this is a big cost saving opportunity, which means we can reinvest back into the future customer experience. Bupa's global dental businesses of over 1,000 clinics are undergoing major transformation projects to make all of this a reality. For instance, in the UK, the UK business is rolling out its new cloud-based practice management system, Dentally, which will be the bedrock of many of these future innovations. Brilliant, that's all from me, Richard. Great, thanks Alistair. Um, really good to hear uh, what's going on around the world and uh, some real commonalities um, uh, across um, the varying different locations. I mean, I think link up between insurers and dental clinics to deliver a seamless experience is um, absolutely um, where things should be uh, and really helping customers focus on their oral health rather than how they pay for it um, is, is a real focus for us here at Booper. As you see with things like direct settlement, where uh, customers don't actually have to part with any money when they're in a boot clinic. They can just go in, get their treatment, walk out, and the claims processed um, on their behalf. Okay, right, let's get on to the poll results. So the results are in, drum roll. <laughs> um, so it's been a landslide. 95% of you think that it will be a blend between face-to-face -face and digital, um, which is good because that's where we think it's going as well. Um, but interestingly, um, there was nothing for 100% digital and a very small number of votes for fully back to face to face. So um, quite a polarised view. Very interesting. Anyway, um, let's move on to our last section before Q&A. And if you've got questions, please get those uh, posted now. And we'll come to those shortly. So finally, um, Neil, it would be great to hear your thoughts on how innovation is shaping insurance products. Great, thanks very much. Thanks, Alistair. Thanks, Susie. I think it's you know it's amazing what's what the potential future of dentistry is going to look like. But then we need to also be part of that with our dental insurance offering. As Alistair mentioned, customer needs and expectations are always changing. And our insurance products need to reflect this. People now expect more predictive and proactive support from their healthcare provider. But understanding our member behavior is our key to developing products that are gonna fit their needs. So if we think since the pandemic, we've seen an increased customer need for virtual dentistry. And this was especially true when practices were closed. And I actually see virtual technology being used as an adjunct to your existing dental relationship. So for those people who are well-maintained and we know they're well-maintained, perhaps they will opt for one visit a year face-to-face -face with another supplement with a virtual checkup with their dentist, as long as they're seeing the hygienist regularly. But we recognize that and our insurance product now covers our customers for virtual appointments. And we introduced also a new support line that connects our customers to a Bupa Dental Care Dentist remotely. And this can be a virtual consultation about an emergency, a general advice, or even a second opinion about treatment. And you can always use that support line to find a local dentist as well. And we will guarantee to find a Bupa dentist for you. But you know, Richard, you know what I'm like, I don't see dental insurance. I don't see it as being a, just a product for claiming the cost of treatment back. I think that we should be using it as proactively enabling our members to improve their oral health. 
So if we look into the future, what's that going to look like for dental insurance products? Well, I think the first thing that I would think about is toothbrushing technology. If we can harness the data from toothbrushing technology, we can actually understand how our customers brush their teeth on a daily basis, not in the time when they come to see us in the surgery and they say, yes, they've been doing it every day, twice a day for the past six months. So we can help improve their oral and general health because we know the links. And we know that this will potentially um, reduce claims in the future. Studies have already shown that electric toothbrush, electric toothbrushing regularly reduces gum disease and also tooth decay. So there'll be possibilities for potentially um, for insurers to reward members for attaining and maintaining good oral health. And we'll have to work out what that might look like. But with better oral health, we'll see reduced treatment, which is a benefit immediately and subsequent claims. But what would I like to see in the future? I'd like to see one point of entry into a dental ecosystem. So what would that look like? You'd have your insurance benefits all in one place. You'd see your documents, you'd see your benefit erosion, you'd have the ability to access claiming online. But not just that, what about your engagement in the surgery with your clinician? What about your daily toothbrushing data being held in that ecosystem? To be able to find your local recommended dentist, get specific advice from your dentist about potential issues and treatment that they may be recommending. Alongside that could be easy to watch treatment explainer videos. And as Alistair mentioned, why not if your hygienist has recommended a specific product, the ability to order direct with home delivery and set up a subscription. And again, we could have within that system direct access for virtual consultations with your dentist or with a dentist within the team if they're not available. And again, once you know what appointments you need, have direct clinic booking as well. So I think the future for dental insurance and provision is going to be really exciting and it's great to be a part of it. Thanks, Richard. Great. Thanks, Neil. And uh, I agree, there's so much innovation out there as well, isn't there? And so many different things we could do that's been accelerated by COVID. But it's really making sure what we, uh, what we get out there and what we try and what we test really resonates with customers. So that's the key for us. Next, now to some Q&A. Uh, we've got loads of questions that have come in. We've got a couple of minutes left. So um, I am going to put some of those to our panel now, starting with you, Fizan. Uh, you're the lucky one to be first in the chair. So uh, we have for you, um, do you think that the that, that NHS dentistry in its current guise is coming to an end? That's a really good question. And it's probably something which is discussed a lot around the coffee tables with dentists. A few things, a few points I'd like to make on this particular topic. So one of the things to understand is the key aim of NHS dentistry is to be able to provide access to dental services, to safe and effective dental services to everybody in the UK. That's the whole point of it. And I think um, COVID has very much highlighted that there are issues surrounding access. Uh, we are struggling with capacity related issues, and it has probably led to a bit of a shift towards an increase in presence of private services and increase in the ability to access private services as well. We do have to be very careful, however, because a large proportion of the population still rely and depend on NHS dental services. If this trend is to continue and access to NHS services starts getting even more withdrawn or even more squeezed, then the people who need access the most are the ones who are going to struggle. So it's really important as, as a dental profession, we do whatever we can to maintain access to NHS dental care and not let it get to that point where we are, you know, it's being replaced by different systems. This, however, has COVID has highlighted a very key opportunity. It's highlighted the opportunity and the importance of prevention in dental care. And I think this is probably a very good time for commissioners to re revisit some of the contract and so on, which they're already doing, because we can help shape behaviors of our clinical practice, as well as patient behaviors based on the type of services and how the services are incentivized. This is probably a very good time to do that. So for example, we can already see things happening in Wales where um, the payment structures are changing so that dentists get remunerated for the additional preventive measures they provide and so on. So there are just a few kind of, of my thoughts as to where I see the opportunities are and the importance of NHS dentistry even in today's kind of world. 
Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. It's going to be fascinating to see how it evolves over the uh, coming months, much as it is in the, the broader NHS. Um, we've got one final question we've got time for, which is actually for me. That's not fair, is it? Um, so a question for me is, um, how is Bupa treating the additional cost of PPE for their clients and members across our insurance plans? So um, there are a couple of things uh, that we have done. Firstly, um, we pay for PPE up to benefit limits, uh, and we made that choice a little while ago, and that's now part of our plans rather than um, an exception. And then secondly, we have just launched a new level of cover, um, level four. So we can choose to buy more benefits um, should they wish um, to do so. And um, PPE costs are coming down, which is uh, which is good, but they're still there. And I think probably uh, for so we heard about aerosol um, earlier and the use of, uh, of those um, is probably here to stay for some time. Um, so uh, our plans will cater for that as uh, we move into the future. OK, that is pretty much all we have time for today. Thank you um, very much to all of our speakers and experts for joining. Um, it's uh, been fantastic having you here uh, and uh, your passion for your subject has really come across. And uh, I hope that's uh, uh, certainly come across to me. I hope it's come across to everybody else. Um, we hope that uh, all of you have joined, have really enjoyed today's event. Thank you for joining us. And um, we always value your feedback. So please complete the survey that we'll share and then we can change and evolve um, for any future sessions. And then finally, if you have any further questions, please reach out to your account manager and uh, we'll definitely get those answered for you. Um, thanks for joining us and uh, we will see you next time. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Bye bye.